Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. And we will talk about a data orchestration system with open source Alexio, uh, AWS EKS with Terraform. Uh, we are super glad everyone could join us today. My name is Bin, and I will be your moderator. The conference, sorry, the presentation will start in a few more minutes. And before we start, let me just introduce our speaker and also the logistic for this presentation. We are very fortunate to have Asistas Palali, founder of Boolean UG, a startup based in Berlin, presenting his work today. So before I introduce you, our speaker, I will have a few housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on build throughout the presentation. If you have any concerns or wish to communicate with me, you may do so by selecting a question from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side on your screen. Just type a message or questions and I will be able to see it. I will be monitoring this throughout the presentation. Or a more, the easier way is to just go to our Slack channel, which is, I will just type in, in the chat box. So you can join us through our Slack channel and you can always post your questions there. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation so we can answer all your questions. To ask a question, um, okay, lastly, uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback from our website. We will email you the link to the presentation by the end of the day. I believe that is all the housekeeping items. So let's meet our speaker. We are very pleased to welcome Vasista. He is the founder of Boolean UG, a startup based in Berlin, Germany, and specializing in implementing data engineering and data science solutions based on distributed computing and cloud computing paradigms. So Vasista, it's all yours. Thank you, Bin. Um, hello, everyone. So today's talk is about uh, data orchestration system uh, with open source Alexio on AWS EKS with Terraform, and primarily why and how uh, we did it, why we had to do it and how we did it. So a little bit about me as uh, Bin has introduced. Um, my name is Vasista Polali. I'm founder of uh, Boolean Uji, a startup in Berlin. We essentially work with our clients to implement data engineering solutions with uh, distributed computing and cloud computing paradigms for their data science and analytical implementations. I'm originally from India. Uh, before coming to Germany about two years ago, I was living actually in the US uh, for about 11 years and working as a data engineer and architect primarily in Midwest and West Coast. So quick look at the agenda for today. Uh, we'll talk about how we have set up processes and CICD pipelines to bootstrap an AWS EKS cluster, that is Kubernetes cluster um, in principle, with IAC infrastructure as code, with Terraform and Git Actions, and also extended it to deploy a cloud native Alexio cluster on EKS and how the scalability of the Alexio cluster was integrated with that of the EKS cluster itself. Also, how to use this setup to load data into Alexio and control the user access to the data. Now, why did we want to do this? That's the first question. So at one of our client places, uh, when we were working with them on doing some uh, data engineering implementations, we ran into a lot of blocks vis-a-vis -vis data security, particularly around legal approvals and sharing of data in view of GDPR. Well, GDPR is very strict and uh, mandatory in uh, Europe, um, maybe relatively lighter. Uh, the rules are, uh, implementations are lighter in the US, uh, but in Europe, it's very strict. So typically in legacy implementations, the data was stored and processed in silos, catering to individual team needs, but with the advent of digitization and also adoption of uh, data science to do more and more exploratory analysis on the data, there was a continuous need for sharing data uh, stored in different storage systems, like AWS S3, HDFS, uh, Azure Blob Storage, and also in different buckets in the same uh, object store, so different buckets in the same S3. This caused a lot of data movement 
if you want to share the data with others and also time delay in getting approvals so nothing in gdpr world nothing moves without legal uh, clearance so you if you want to copy the data you want to retain the data or you want to delete the data access the data everything goes through legal because uh, also because it entails like huge uh, fines and penalties uh, if they and don't do it so so this caused a lot of data movement um, and then primarily around making multiple copies of data providing access control uh, data retention and deletion of data uh, so we were like just raising uh, requests for access and then then waiting for that to happen uh, meanwhile all our uh, plans were screwed for and we were working in agile uh, so you know uh, the plans are like relatively compact and also there was this uh, additional etl development effort and maintenance to achieve it like to move data once we get the approval then we have to have new pipelines to move data and then we have to have uh, audits and then monitoring mechanism to delete the data whenever uh, we get the message or the queue uh, that the data has to be deleted from the data security and things like that. There is also a need for data sharing between various spark jobs in the ETL. And apart from this uh, GDPR, we also had like a need to share data between uh, spark jobs and also iterative machine learning workflows where intermediate data had to be written back to the storage system continuously and re-ingested by the subsequent steps causing higher processing times, uh, increased data transfer and increased cost. So there was basically more disk IO and network IO. And we were also looking into some kind of fault tolerance for long running jobs. Like some jobs were running for hours and then if something happens in the job crashes, then we lose the data that's in the memory. And then for this, we need to have like uh, checkpoints or need to write intermediate data uh, to a persistent storage again causing high disk io and network io and then also apart from that causing pain like we have a bad job running overnight and in the morning we realize that it actually failed because of this uh, network io or some issue and then we lost the data or we have the intermediate data in the s3 bucket and then we have to ingest all of it again so a typical example was for example we had a Airflow, airflow DAG implementing processing of data in some thousands of files and like 20 stages and there was need to pass data between the steps. So the only option was to write the data to an external file system and read it back every time and we had to do it multiple times a day. So MVP. The goal was to build a cloud native data sharing system and the, so we actually wanted to uh, put some effort into mitigating these uh, issues and then uh, streamline the process of accessing data as well as processing it. So the goal was to build a cloud native data sharing system by taking open source Alexio and wrapping it in a set of processes that would adhere to minimally required enterprise wide standards and DevOps principles of security, automation, infrastructure as code, continuous improvement and deployment at sh and short lead times because primarily we were in agile and then I, the reason we are call, we have called it mvp because we wanted to go with a devops mindset uh, where we roll out like the basic features in the framework or the implementation and then we get back uh, feedback and then we uh, continuously improve and do incremental development on it so it was actually supposed to be kind of framework that each each, uh, each team could use as a starting point. So we would build a prototype and show them how it's done. Then each team can actually take it and extend it uh, to their needs. So we thought leveraging Alexio would be a very good option since it's a virtual distributed file system uh, that works as a data orchestration layer, allowing mounting of data from different data sources to provide a unified namespace for all the data and also that we could get improved read and write speeds uh, in the view of it being in memory. So that was a big advantage too. Since the projected usage was currently decentralized, the ground rules were uh, to use open source Alexia out of box without any customization or forking or any need to maintain the open source code. So we just wanted to use as it is. 
and then if uh, with every upgrade uh, we should be able to i mean every upgrade of the alexio we should be able to use alexio as it is with the new features uh, that alexio open source provides so a quick look at alexio uh, for all those new guys uh, who might not be familiar with it uh, as i said earlier it's a data orchestration layer that helps unify your data residing in different file stores uh, please do visit their uh, website uh, to more, know more uh, they have uh, spectacular documentation and uh, examples there you can actually follow uh, and then uh, try to maybe use it Elastic Kubernetes service, AWS EKS uh, is also a managed service on AWS. Uh, it makes it easy for you to spin clusters and scale them on demand, uh, Kubernetes clusters. So it's just a quick look on AWS. So bootstrapping AWS EKS with Terraform. So the environment for the prototype system was on AWS EKS uh, with an assigned minimum size of five nodes. Uh, we started with that. Uh, with an easy to auto scaling group that would maintain the required capacity. Infrastructure as code was achieved by using Terraform and its state was being maintained as remote backend in the Terraform cloud, in a workspace in Terraform cloud. CICD pipelines were built using GitHub Actions and the persistent layer for the Alexio pod was on AWS Elastic file system, which is also a managed NFS in AWS. So the process was to make a branch out of the master with the name of the assigned task. Like we were using Jira. So typically it was the task number and name uh, for all of you that are familiar uh, with Jira. So, and then update the variables uh, driving the Terraform values like cluster size and VPC, CIDR block, uh, we just provided whatever uh, options uh, we had to, for example, and then commit and push the code and create a pull request. On a pull request, Git Actions would run basic checks uh, until Terraform plan, uh, like typically it would uh, set up environment, do an init, and then generate a plan and see there are no errors. That's only on pull request. And then once the, we get the approval from the stakeholders, the code would be merged to the main branch, and then that would take care of the <clears throat> Terraform apply. That means actually applying the plan and then coming up with the uh, spinning up with the AWS EKS cluster. So, and then also uh, EFS uh, file system along with it. So we used our own custom Terraform module for EKS, uh, which also after the successful spinning of the cluster creates an admin user, creates a necessary auth config map, creates a cube config file for the admin user and uploads the configuration into the provided S3 bucket. It also enables the dashboard, uh, Kubernetes dashboard, which can be proxied into from the user's local machine. So it has to be kind of put forward, forwarded from the local machine and uh, accessed on local host, Kubernetes dashboard. So I guess these steps must be familiar to you guys, but I just wanted to do a quick recap uh, to set the pace. So once the EKS cluster is ready, we have the necessary YAML files to deploy Alexio in the code repo in a particular namespace. The masters would be deployed as stateful sets uh, that guarantees the ordering of the pods. In our case, we went with two replicas, uh, which gives us two pods, like Alexio master zero and Alexio master one, providing embedded high availability. You know that pods are ephemeral. Uh, so even with respinning of a pod after crash, the naming convention doesn't change. You still get Alexa. If Alexa Master Zero crashes, you'll get back Alexa Master Zero. And then the runtime configuration is still valid because the workers already know the master names and then they keep looking for the same masters. The Alexa configuration is provided by a config map and two services uh, are spun up uh, on top of these uh, uh, stateful set pods. The, worker were, the workers were deployed as daemon sets, and these pods provide guarantees that at least one pod will be running per node. So essentially, each node in the EKS cluster, uh, EKS cluster will be running one Alexio worker node. After this deployment, the scalability of the Alexio cluster is integrated into the scalability of the EKS cluster. 
say you want to increase the Alexio cluster size, just add more nodes to your EKS cluster. And boom, you have increased your Alexio cluster capacity because every node will give you a new worker. And then in the same way, you want to bring it down, just uh, scale down the EKS cluster and then your worker capacity decrease. You can also increase the storage and compute power by just opting for different EC2 instance types for your new nodes. So that's a very flexible uh, advantage. So we created a persistent volume uh, with EFS using EFS CI provisioner and attached it to the Alexio cluster with a persistent volume claim. So EFS is again the uh, managed NFS in AWS. None of the services or pods deployed are exposed to the outside world. So everything is uh, inside uh, Kubernetes internal network. Everything is accessed only in Kubernetes internal network. We did not have any, except for the API server of the Kubernetes. And nothing else was uh, exposed to the outside world. Now the next step is to provide the team a way to expose only the required or allowed data for the time period they want to uh, provide and retract it later. Say the security team or a team uh, just wants to provide like a certain amount of data to certain users for a time period and then retract it or uh, uh, take it back uh, the permissions, uh, then it can it should be able to do it. That too, without the necessity to make a copy. Like so, the primary goal was like making copies was already there. So if you want data, they'll just make a copy or he'll have you make a copy and then once your job is done and then when they uh, remove the approvals, you have to delete it. So the goal was to avoid that and then keep the control firmly in the data owner's hand or the team's hand. Hence now comes in the Alexio mount command. We can use this to mount data from an existing file system directory onto an, onto an Alexio directory and access act as if it's local to the Alexio file system. So basically you mount the data and then you can access it through the Alexio file system and as if you're accessing a local directory from it. The slide shows an example on, sorry, on of how a SC bucket is being mounted onto an Alexio directory. So this command Alexio FS mount is used to do that. And then of course we provide the AWS secret and AWS um, key through GitHub secrets. So unmounting can also be achieved similarly with the unmount command uh, instead of mount, the uh, same thing. So how did we set this up? So the process, the steps in the process where a team member creates a branch, adds the list of the S3 buckets to be mounted in the corresponding Alexio directories, turns the job into the Git work workflow for execution and creates a pull request. The data owner or the responsible person for the data security, then reviews the request uh, and an approval. Uh, someone in the team merges the branch to main, triggering the Git workflow job. So here, <clears throat> the, the process is established and then the approval mechanism uh, is through the approving the pull request and then it's firmly in the hands of the data security team again or the data owner. The steps in the workflow are, uh, there is a .env file in the code repo with the mount details, that is the Alexio directory and the S3 directories that have to be mounted. And then this can be accessed in the runner. First it's loaded into the runner and can be accessed as variables uh, provided as output of the step. So in Git actions, you can actually load some data and provide it to the subsequent steps as output of that step. Uh, through uh, variables. So that's how we did it. And then the cube config file is downloaded from the provided S3 bucket in the .env file. The user in the file needs to have a role binding that enables them to port forward the ports in the namespace that Alexio is running in. In this case, we were using app user and its job was only to port forward. Uh, and then we had a cube config file uh, to do kubectl uh, with it. And Alexio master by default runs on port 1398 and, and one this port from one of the master ports is forwarded to a local port in the runner. Here in our case, it was the same port. We use the same mapping 1398. 
Now, if, uh, once the port forward is successful, there is a connection established to the Alexio master to execute file system commands. Next, the uh, tar file with the Alexio binaries is downloaded because we will have, we need the access to Alexio binaries to run SS commands. So it's downloaded from a S3 bucket specified in the uh, .env file again. Unpacked in Alexio mount command is iteratively run on the list of S3 buckets and corresponding Alexio directories. So the caveat here is that we made sure that only the app user that is executing the port forward has permissions to do so in Alexio namespace and no one else. Apart from the app user in the <clears throat> that's actually port forwarding in the GitHub actions, no other user has port forwarding, forwarding capability. That negates the problem of any user uh, trying to access the Alexio master directly from a remote machine uh, with port forward. And the second one was we never put any files directly under root as that is controlled by user Alexio, which is pretty open permissions uh, because of the open source nature. Um, so we always put data in the subdirectories. On success, the standard post action cleanup steps are executed and the workflow finishes. So now if you get into the Alexio shell and run ls command, you can see the mountain data. Now that the data is mounted and exposed, uh, the question was how do we control the access to it? Open source Alexio doesn't provide a security mechanism out of box and any customization was out of scope for us. But one thing open source Alexio does provide uh, is a tool to set POSIX like permissions on the Alexio directories in the form of set FACL command. That's very handy. So we decided to try to use it and see how far we can go. So typically the mounted data is only accessible by the user whose credentials were used to perform the operation. Like in this case, the service user whose AWS key and the secret were used to mount the data from S3 becomes the user uh, owner of the directory in Alexia as well. All other requests from different client process users is rejected. The slide shows a typical set FSL command used to set the user permissions and remove them as well. So the process to set the remove permissions with the git workflow is similar to one we used for mounting data. The list of users and permissions is provided to the workflow by similar mechanism loading dot even env file as discussed in the previous slides. This helped the teams by not having to create and maintain multiple roles for users uh, based on the file system and the required user privileges and above all keep track of them and make sure to disable them after use which can be a tedious task. So their bookkeeping came down. They did not have to keep track of all the users they were creating and then their permissions and do regular audits. And then in case they forget, maybe later on um, do some more uh, bookkeeping or audits to delete them. Uh, particularly, this is uh, more of an overhead when the infrastructure is centralized. There are a lot of uh, users and a lot of applications to keep track of. So the next step is to enable processing of the data with Kubernetes Spark. So we have seen that we could amount the, mount the data and also set permissions on it. So the question was how to make sure the user can access the right data and not access unauthorized data. While this is a bit tricky, say when there are a lot of external users involved, but since we are catering to primarily internal users, uh, governed by robust security policies and working in a trust-based environment, uh, it was relatively easy to track and audit the user operations. So that was a good thing. Uh, how did we do this? Uh, we set up a job in the Git workflow that would build a Docker image with the default user as the user accessing the data in Alexio and push it to AWS ECR. The user can then use this image to submit jobs to Kubernetes Spark in cluster mode, where the driver also runs in a pod in the Kubernetes cluster. Since the user running the Spark application in the driver and the executor is also the Alexio client process user because the default user in the pod is the, uh, the user, uh, say, in a way owner of the image. And then when he accesses that 
the Alexio data, then the Alexio client process user automatically becomes him, the file system user. So in this way, you can only access the data is authorized to, and all other requests will be rejected. So the whole idea of this effort was to do a case study on how we can set up the infrastructure and the necessary processes to easily and securely share data between the teams in the organization and also cut down on the data movement and ETL development effort at the same time. So they were uh, spending a lot of time and effort uh, on ETL jobs and they were so basically, they were, there was a lot of firefighting going on and uh, multiple teams. So they had only little time left for newer implementation or uh, upgradations, also increasing their technical debt. So in a way, they were also looking for uh, some kind of processes or uh, some kind of system that will also help them cut down on all this uh, uh, firefighting and extra maintenance that they have to do. The final outcome was that we could demonstrate that this could be achieved by using Alexio and Kubernetes and develop a framework that can be adapted by the teams to spin up and maintain Alexio clusters and also expose and access data in a scalable and secure way. One more aspect was saving costs, of course, because cloud computing is all about costs. So the question was, do we need to keep the Alexio cluster running all the time? So when we started out, well, this was one of the questions we delved into. Should we keep running it all the time, uh, increasing costs like a big centralized cluster? And of course, maintenance, or can we do it ad hoc? Like spin up the EKS and Alexio clusters on demand, expose the data uh, for processing, say for a certain time, and then just tear it down and then re-spin it again whenever you, we need it. Uh, well, both options are available with this setup, I must say. Using AWS e EFS as a persistent layer, you can persist the metadata related to mount points and user permissions and other metadata in Alexio FS, even after you tear down, tear down the cluster. You just tear down the EKS cluster and the Alexio cluster, but you keep the EFS still standing up. So just spin the next cluster on the same volume claim, and you get back all the mounted directories and user permissions intact. So reducing, of course, costs. Um, and of course, storing data in EFS is not that expensive uh, compared to we spinning like big EKS clusters and paying for this uh, EC2 instances. Compared to that, I think storing in AWS EFS and then just spinning clusters on a ad hoc way uh, will definitely reduce costs. We also implemented time-bound operations uh, that ran on a schedule. So in GitHub Access, you can also schedule a workflow. So we, we implemented that as well. So we, we schedule a workflow to mount data automatically uh, from a specific date and time and scheduling another job to unmount it again at a later date. So this makes the data available only for a specific time. And then you don't have to like, really keep track uh, and then manually like mount and unmount all the time you can just set up the schedule you can tell the user that hey this data would be available from this date and time to this data type of processing after that we are going to retract it so that can be done in automated way uh, that's uh, i think a big boost here uh, same goes for uh, user permissions so this, this part was very liked by our client uh, when we came up with this and implemented this. Um, in a way, he could use it for uh, his other workflows as well. Um, so yeah, we can also set and remove permissions on, on a schedule. So while this presentation talks about a simple flow, on how to spin and use the Alexio for data orchestration for uh, data sharing, particularly and security. There are also other flows uh, that could be considered while setting up such systems. So one would be like adopting this process to centralize the operations. So, and data security teams and the kind of processes that need to be set up, especially up around approvals and auditing. So there should, there, there, it's definitely possible uh, to uh, adapt this to centralized uh, operations and data security teams. All we have to do is make sure we come up with the right 
processes and standards um, and do regular auditing. I think it's very much possible. And then Alexio and EKS can do it. Uh, currently, the Spark deployment in cluster mode uses Kubernetes internal network for communication between drivers and executors. Uh, like if you remember earlier, I said like the <clears throat> the EKS cluster is closed and the Alexio and EKS, they're not open to the <coughs> outside world except for the API server, <coughs> which is used to submit the Spark jobs. But <coughs> there is... <coughs> there's, but there is also a use case where you should be able to submit jobs in the client mode where the driver runs from the remote machine and the two-way communication is enabled between the driver and the Kubernetes cluster. And, and also if need be the driver and the Alexio cluster. And so this one thing uh, can be looked into, but I think Personally, this would require a bit of customization on the Alexio open source code uh, by the implementer. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, I was in fact also planning for a demo of the process and had a pre-recorded session, but could not get it down to the length of time that fits within our time constraints. Uh, in fact, in a meaningful way, I tried, but it became very patchy. Uh, so I thought I might as well not do it. So the floor is open now for any questions. Uh, but in case you want to reach out to me at a later stage, feel free to contact me on my email ID, persista.polali at booleancomputing.com, provided in one of the top slides. Um, also, in case you are more uh, interested and want to deep dive more technically, maybe we can also do a, a code walkthrough. Um, just reach out to me and we can schedule something. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Basistas. Now uh, the floor is open. Anyone, uh, you, you can just raise a question in the chat box or on our Slack channel. So before uh, we get a questions from the audience, Basista, I, I have a question for you. So as a maintainer, mm -hmm. Uh, and also open source mm -hmm. developer for Alexio. Uh, what's your feedback, or maybe you, if you want to name one of two features you want most uh, to, in the open source Alexio, what will be them? Uh, you mean the uh, any existing feature that I really like, or anything new that I would like to have? Oh, either way, just like basically it's a uh, maybe two questions. What's the existing feature you really like, your customer, your clients really like? Or is there anything missing you think like if we add, this will just create a lot of value for you, uh, for your solution? Sure, for uh, existing features, definitely uh, unified namespace, able to mount data from various sources. That's an awesome thing. I think uh, this makes uh, Alexia very unique. It's uh, one of its kind uh, technology in doing this. Um, and also, so I like uh, it being in memory. Hmm. Um, and so there are more than two, I think. And the third one is like, I also like that it's, uh, we can deploy it in multiple platforms. Okay. So primarily also on on-prem or some cloud instances also make it cloud native. And then the one feature I really want in open source, uh, if possible, is some kind of security. I know that you have a abstract class, right? To that we can extend and customize to provide like simple auth with username and password, if I remember right. Uh, so so there's a, there, there is a already uh, there, there is a already a we call the simple authentication scheme provided in Alexio mm -hmm. Open Source, uh, which basically when you are talking using the Alexio client, they will just go to the local Linux shell and check what's the user, what's the group, UID and GID, and report mm -hmm. it to the Alexio master. So basically we believe what is reported by Linux. Uh, if you are if you are user foo on this local Linux, you are you are you are treated as user foo and on mm -hmm. Luxio master nodes. So that's the simple authentication. Um, but there is a more advanced authentication schemes like uh, Kerberos 
or mm -hmm. some out app. Uh, this in, in this ways, uh, I think they are available in the in the enterprise edition. So, uh, are you talking about this kind of like authentication uh, mechanism? Yeah. So I was of the, like of course the this kind of uh, implementation, but I was of the opinion that the simple auth we had to do some coding in there, right, to get it up and running. It's not like out of the box. Uh, it is. Out, it should be out of box. If you uh, if you if if something if everything is configured correctly, but there is always a complication because Aluxio depends on how you use Aluxio client. Sometimes mm. it's running, for example, in the uh, in the in the yarn in the in the yarn. Uh, for example, in the old days in yarn node manager, it's a long mm. running. It's a it's long running there. Uh, basically, uh, someone like there should be a user launch this node manager for yarn right but yarn may run applications for many other different mm -hmm. users so there will mm -hmm. be a one translation to uh to basically dedicate these uh, users to Alexa. and there, there are something in in that sense there is something you need to uh, configure how to dedicate the users um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah so um that's yeah. one thing and, and i mean there are some other in some other environments, there might be some more uh, similar complicated, some similar complication. So, uh, it, so we need to go like walk through the scenario and see what is the problem there. But I, I sh like ideally, this simple authentication should work. Like basically, uh, de depending relying on someone tells the client, oh, this is mm -hmm. user from user the group bar. Cool. Uh, good to know. Uh, maybe I'll spend uh, some time exploring that option as well. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, we can just walk this off. <laughs> we can just walk uh, together and see what's your what's the issue you see. But uh, in case there's a bug, feel free to create an issue. It's you know mm -hmm. it's open source project. Uh, with we're always we always welcome users to report their issues and see whether there's a bug or there's a configuration issue or this is something mm -hmm. a new feature. Yeah. Cool. Uh, this is a really useful, valuable, valuable feedback for us. Anyone else from the audience you want to ask anything to Vasista? Okay. Uh, if not, I know it's pretty. It's it's already late in in Berlin time. I will not block you from your dinner. So uh, thank you, thank you again for having this great presentation. Thank you, Ben, for the oh, opportunity. Actually, there is one question. Uh, there's one question from Luan. Hey Luan, long time no see. Uh, this is on Slack. This question is from Slack. Your unique mm -hmm. change from the Alexio local Helm package to EKS was a deploy a persistent volume on EFS, or do you have made any other changes? Ah, uh, so for the persistent volume claim, um, it's pretty much. Uh, what like uh, you can see in the git repo uh, let's say open source git repo the templates but for uh, pinning the persistent volume on uh, aws efs we had to set up a storage class uh, with efs ci and then use the file system id uh, to create a persistent volume uh, that's uh, separate uh, and then deploy the alexio um, YAMLs or Elixir resources, and then point the Elixir PV claim to uh, this uh, persistent volume using the storage class EFS, the storage class that you created using the EFS uh, CI provisioner. So primarily, you have to make sure you deploy the right storage class and then uh, provide it in the Elixir PV claim. So I mean, if you know how to do it, it's like pretty straightforward. It's not a big problem. Yeah, both Lua and Investista, you are on the same Slack channel. I mean, you can all, always go go to the channel and and talk about the tech technique and underneath this change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, please reach out. So, yeah, sounds good. Um, feel free to check out uh, Vasista. Feel free to check out afterwards on the on our Slack channel. So Lua and put this question on the Slack channel. Mm -hmm. Sure, we'll do. Yep. Thank you so much uh, and have a good night, my sister. Thank you so much for having us and sharing your you. knowledge about this. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Bye.
Bye.